um, and welcome to um, this uh, uh, interesting and timely uh, event at Hudson Institute. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Sorin Dukaro. I'm uh, Hudson Institute Senior Fellow and former NATO Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges. And it's my uh, distinct honor and pleasure uh, to be introducing and hosting uh, today uh, Admiral uh, Manfred Nielsen, who is the Deputy Supreme Allied Commander from uh, uh, Commander Transformation, who will um, give you a sense of um, the uh, NATO military transformation agenda, uh, also in the context of the upcoming uh, NATO summit that will take place between 11 and 12 of uh, July in uh, in Brussels. Um, as you know, like uh, uh, any uh, important organization, but in particular because NATO is the, the collective uh, defense alliance, um, crosses a period of uh, significant adaptation and uh, transformation uh, pushed forward by the changing security uh, environment uh, that is uh, characterized by a lot of emerging challenges, by hybrid threats, disruptive technologies. And the mission of uh, um, Atlantic Command uh, Transformation, one of the two strategic commands of NATO, along with the, um, uh, command, uh, the Atlantic Command operations uh, in shape uh, in uh, Europe, in Mons, the mission of uh, ACT is uh, to lead the military uh, transformation, um, and um, that is the changes in terms of uh, military structures, processes, forces, capabilities, uh, doctrines, to enable uh, NATO to fulfill its uh, core uh, mandate of um, collective defense uh, and its uh, level of ambition. And um, I should also mention that uh, uh, ACT uh, was, uh, for me personally, uh, the, the closest partner in the, the military structure of uh, the Alliance. Um, in my former job at the uh, Assistant Secretary General from, for Emerging Challenges, because uh, uh, while on the policy side of the House, um, I had the chance to, to lead uh, the adaptation of uh, policy development and then implementation to the new challenges. I think the, the ACT was coming with this uh, down-to-earth um, uh, uh, military transformation requirements uh, that uh, was linked to the core business of the, the alliance. And uh, this, uh, this command has benefited from some exceptional leadership just to mention that the current Secretary of Defense of the United States, General Mattis, um, has um, been one of the brilliant um, uh, commanders. It was also my time as a member of the North Atlantic Council. And currently, uh, the Commander General Mercier, along with uh, Deputy Commander Admiral uh, Nielsen, uh, are um, indeed um, forward-looking uh, 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 personalities, uh, great minds, and also great leaders in pushing forward the, the transformation um, agenda. Um, by the way, we're not speaking of just about, uh, you know, adapting to, uh, you know, technological advancements, uh, see how they uh, impact uh, uh, military operations, the uh, modern warfare, but also how to drive a cultural change in terms of mind, mindset and, and planning. Admiral uh, Nielsen um, has been uh, in command, in his, Admiral, his current command, since March 2016. Um, he has a distinguished career, in the, had a distinguished career in the German military as a Navy officer and underwater weapons uh, specialist. Uh, commanded units at all levels, including um, as commander of uh, task force 150 during the NATO operation um, Enduring Freedom in 2015. He was being commander-in-chief of the German fleet, 
um, had leading position in the Federal German Ministry of Defense and also has been chief of uh, staff for joint support services of the Bundeswehr. He has um, graduated the Bundeswehr Command and Staff College and has also a master's uh, in economics and organizational um, sciences. Uh, several uh, awards, among which uh, the Gold Cross for, of uh, uh, Honor. But I would say, uh, first and foremost, uh, he is uh, somebody who uh, encapsulates uh, this uh, fresh uh, drive at NATO, especially on the military side, for a constant uh, adaptation to the new environment uh, um, that is defined by this age of accelerations and uh, transformation driven by uh, especially disrupted, uh, disruptive technologies. And with this, um, I would uh, pass the floor to uh, Admiral Nielsen, who will um, present his uh, thoughts on, on the way forward. Uh, and then we'll have a short uh, set of uh, um, questions and answers on the podium, after which I will open the floor for your particular points of interest. Admiral, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would invite you to participate in the premiere because we are aware that we should be present in, the, uh, in Facebook and social media. And I anticipated that the majority of you have, uh, don't have any clue what ACT is doing. So I prepared a short, clip, uh, short uh, video clip, and I would kindly ask you to play. The world is at the threshold of a new era. The success of military operations will be decided by human-machine teaming, powered or augmented by artificial intelligence. Human artificial intelligence teaming will be a key driver for the use of artificial intelligence in the military. Human augmentation, underpinned by artificial intelligence, will be the extension of centuries of human endeavor in which people sought to become faster, stronger, and smarter through the use of tools and machines. To get this right, effective human-machine teaming for decision-making requires a strong understanding of how good teams operate. Innovative research, experimentation, and planning is critical to charting the course ahead. NATO must employ human artificial intelligence teaming efficiently and ethically. For that, NATO must achieve an effective convergence of technology, operating concepts, and adapt its organization and processes. NATO's Allied Command Transformation is leading that charge. Thank you very much. You see, the way ahead is prepared, but uh, we are hard working on the solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel very much honored and privileged for having the opportunity to address the topic of NATO's military transformation agenda in an age of emerging and disruptive technologies here at the famous Hudson Institute today. The Institute was founded already in 1961. The aim and intention was, and still is, to challenge conventional thinking and helping manage strategic transitions to the future to, through interdisciplinary studies in defense, national relations, economics, healthcare, technology, culture, and law. So a per perfect partner for ACT. And even 57 years later, Hudson stands for, ex for ex uh, excellency and as a role model for many other think tanks. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ducaro, for your kind words of introduction and for giving me the audience to explain some of our most pressing challenges and to share with you, ladies and gentlemen, Allied Command Transformation's thoughts. To clarify for you, ACT's role, which may, might be confusing, especially with the term transformation in our name. ACT is based in Norfolk, Virginia, which is NATO's 
home in America and its only footprint on this continent. Approximately 500 people are working in Norfolk. 29 nations are uh, represented, NATO nations plus approximately 10 partner nations, and we have some subordinate commands in Europe, and as the ambassador said, the last American commander, Allied Command Transformation, was your current Secretary of Defense, um, Mattis. We are the strategic command for NATO, and we are responsible for warfare development activities for our alliance. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an incredibly exciting place to serve now, as our focus is to identify and analyze future trends, thoughts on what to expect from the time ahead for the military environment and to establish the bridge to our variety of challenges in order to increase the effectiveness and relevancy of our current and future capabilities. Essential forward thinking ensures that we are relevant today and especially tomorrow. Of course, forward thinking is not unique to just NATO. Nations, other international organizations, think tanks, and academia spend a tremendous amount of time and resources in developing and utilizing their strategic foresight to remain relevant. I am deeply convinced that we all share basically the same understanding. Today's and the future security environment is filled with ambiguity, complexity, surprise, and shocks. And perhaps unpredictability seems to be the new normal. Allied Command's transformation most important outputs are the strategic foresight analysis, or in short, SFA. The SFA isn't an attempt to predict the future, but instead depict political, social, technological, economic, and environmental trends and highlight their implication for the alliance up to 30 years ahead. Based on the trend analysis, our framework for future alliance operations, or in short, FFAO, identifies key attributes driving our effects to keep our edge over and potential adversary or change in security environment. Key attributes are flexibility, interoperability, and of course, speed in innovation. In short, we indicate what forces might need to be and to do for 10 to 15 years ahead. And this contributes essentially to our NATO defense planning process, or in short, NDPP. It's a four-year cycle which is the primary process to facilitate the identification, development, and delivery of NATO's present and future capability requirements. And just to clarify, in the past, when we talked about capabilities, we mainly meant platforms, ships, airplanes, tanks. And that's changing. The NDPP is the principal vehicle for the harmonization of capability development efforts undertaken by allies individually, multinationally, or collectively. Ladies and gentlemen, the mentioned key attributes, flexibility, interoperability, and pace in innovation are easy to postulate, but difficult to bring to life. They require detailed understanding and a concerted effort enabled with the right adaptive policy, planning guidance, and decision-making speed. And we are all aware we can't work on the future without being connected with many others. And we, as military, have to recognize that we will not always sit in the driver's seat. Ladies and gentlemen, we have already established a common understanding
of the importance of disruptive technologies such as artificial intelligence, autonomy, or quantum computing. We share the understanding of the urgency for our alliance to adapt and the speed needed to act in order to take advantage of the opportunities and meet the challenges alike. Our insight in this regard is pretty simple. We have to operate and to adapt at the same time. Since NATO's inception in 1949, technological lead has been an essential enabler of our military superiority. However, factors such as the increase in defense spending, the availability, the proliferation of knowledge and technologies have provided rivals and potential adversaries with growing capabilities. They have the ability to challenge the alliance politically, militarily, technologically, and they don't hesitate to do so. A substantial part of the rapid modernization of potential competitors' military capabilities is supported by access to and use of emerging and disruptive technologies. A number of state and non-state actors are developing these new capabilities. At the NATO Warsaw Summit in 2016, nations agreed to identify advanced and emerging technologies to evaluate their applicability in the military domain and to implement them through innovative solutions. Indeed, exploiting emerging and disruptive technologies will allow us to develop game-changing disruptive capabilities in order to provide NATO the ability to counter potential adversaries as the alliance continues to deter, defend, and guarantee peace. Therefore, at the upcoming July 2018 summit in Brussels, NATO leaders will discuss modernization efforts to include steps we are taking and probably a roadmap to guide our future work. Ladies and gentlemen, let me elaborate a few examples without going into the technical details. First, artificial intelligence and human-machine teaming. Artificial intelligence refers to the already existing ability of machines to match humans in terms of learning, reasoning, planning, and acting in complex cyber-physical environments. The potential impact includes replacement of human decision makers, autonomous robot or vehicle control, automated information fusion, and more. This means intelligent machines are able to assist and augment NATO staffs as they plan and conduct operations, trains, uh, uh, operations, train, exercise, and by that, prepare for the future. Artificial intelligence can generate opportunities to automatically take advantage of vulner vulnerabilities they discover. This is especially true in the cyber arena. And with the use of quantum computing, put at risk passwords, enable greater use of image processing, and as we already experiencing in our society's increasingly complex autonomous generation of false multimedia information. This will drive NATO to require new processes, new skills, and new policies. Without any doubts, it will require political willingness and new legal frameworks in order to fully exploit the potential of the new technologies. NATO has to leave its comfort zones and to increase pace at all levels. Second, autonomy. Autonomy is becoming much more relevant in modern warfare and is therefore of particular importance of NATO. ACT's and therefore NATO's autonomy program is a coherent 
and structured approach initiated in 2017, which encompasses both existing activities and future projects. Its purpose is to identify opportunities and risks, facilitate awareness within NATO of national capability development efforts, and ensure interoperability standards. The program focuses as well on the education and training of our NATO command structure personnel and on the legal and ethical implications of autonomy, especially in the military environment. Within this program, a very close collaboration with industry and academia to leverage their expertise, experience, and development steps in autonomy is a must and not an option. ACT's mindset is to be a bridge to connect operational experience, knowledge, and resources between NATO, industry, academia, and others. And we have some practical examples going well beyond the known, such as flying drones. In 2016 already, three autonomous machines displayed autonomy as a maritime surface surface robot. They talked to an underwater robot and ordered that to launch a flying robot based on pre-planned routes, but updated through real-time data gathered in the situation. Moreover, all of this happened by mobile communication and sensor robotic packages. Ladies and gentlemen, maybe some of you have seen the low-cost swarming technology where 30 mini drones were launched from a tube in less than a minute, created a swarm, able to self-reconfigure and to overwhelm an adversary autonomously. These kinds of capabilities will change our approach to warfare. We must start now to consider both the opportunities, but also the challenges should an adversary choose uh, to use them against us. My third area is cyberspace as a domain of operations. Already at the Warsaw Summit in 2014, the heads of state and government agreed that cyber defense is a part of NATO's core task of collective defense. At the Warsaw Summit in 2016, they pledged to enhance the cyber defense of their national networks and infrastructures and recognize cyberspace as a domain for military operations alongside air, land, and sea, and maybe in the future, even space. However, cyberspace differs from all the other domains as constantly evolving man-made construct. Unlike all other domains, NATO has an international organization, owns, operates, and protects its own portion of cyberspace, the so-called NATO enterprise. Additionally, with a relatively low barrier of to entry, malicious actors can attain the skills and resources required to persistently engage in disruptive cyberspace activities. And they do. Their ability to remotely ma manipulate and or disrupt activities through cyberspace increases their opportunities to rapidly generate effects by complicating attribution. Therefore, recognizing cyberspace as a domain of military operations provides us the opportunity to improve NATO's ability to conduct operations across all domains and maintain our freedom of action and decision in all circumstances. NATO has already taken steps to operationalize these domains, starting with identifying the NATO cyber system gaps, which are being addressed in the NATO command structure functional adaptation process. We will establish a cyber operation center in order to enhance command and control of our operations and through cyberspace. 
This endeavor is far away from being over. In fact, I have to admit that we are at the beginning. We will have to take a look at cyber doctrine, cyber education, training, exercises, and evaluation, as well as at the political level and especially within the legal frameworks. We can already report some success stories, as now all NATO allies have established cyber policy frameworks and some type of organization to coordinate cyber defense and cyber security at the national levels. And most of the allies have even incident response capabilities. Please allow me at this point perhaps one personal remark. The wording cyber defense and cyber offense is misleading. We should much more focus in cyber security and intelligence. To reach an effective level of protection against cyber attacks, you inherently need to know what the adversities are capable of. My first, but not my uh, last point, is quantum computing. This affects all of the so far mentioned capabilities. Thanks to quantum computing, computers are about to become unbelievably powerful and will challenge all of our knowledge acquired so far. Quantum computers no longer relying on transistors and binary signals, but on microwaves. Quantum articles will be fast, very fast, the fastest you can imagine. One prototype proved to be one million times faster than its normal counterpart counterparts. Those computers will be able to simulate previously impossible large chemical reactions leading to new materials, and they will enable disruption-proof navigation technology. And not only with quantum computing enable us to process huge amounts of data, but it will also enable artificial intelligence to process data more effectively, such as analyzing complex sets of variables to find the best military course of action being in the realm of feasibility. Quantum computers will also have a large impact on cybersecurity. Current cryptographic methods focus on using complex math to scramble data into unintelligible content with a vulnerable uh, uh, will be vulnerable to their activities abil abilities quantum computers will be able to rapidly decrypt these content making current cryptographic methods trivial to break overall the first country to successful commercialize quantum technologies will gain a huge first adopter advantage both the devices and in all of the discoveries, the technology will unlock. Ladies and gentlemen, the four mentioned examples all have two things in common. They will affect the civilian work much more than the military one. And they will all are based on big data and situational awareness. Therefore, enhancing strategic awareness has rightly been identified as the single most pressing issue for NATO as a whole. NATO needs to better understand information areas of interest to, be, to avoid being surprised. And as the military is not the key player here, we will need to expand our knowledge gathering beyond traditional areas and much more into the civilian environment. It's a kind of open source intelligence, if you like. We need to go beyond our conventional means to be up to speed with the congruence of trends and possibly increase predictability of future shocks. The Amazons, Googles, or Apples of today routinely connect our geolocations where we like to work, eat, shop, work out or spend our leisure time. With our topics of interest and our spending routines in a complex analysis, they utilize 
the mentioned big data using artificial intelligence and autonomy to create fiscal value and to shape our consumer behavior. So what makes us believe that this kind of capability in the hands of malicious players would not be used to target NATO? On the opposite side, an opportunity exists for NATO to utilize the same capability to provide analysis of security environment, build situational awareness, and speed decision making. The question is, are we recognizing the wind of change and are we willing to act? The shown examples are today's technology and capabilities. Imagine where we will be 10 years ahead. We have to leave our comfort zones. We need to take decision now, not tomorrow. NATO needs to follow the civilian, mainly non-defense industry-driven technology, innova uh, technology innovation rigorously and bridge today with tomorrow. Otherwise, I fear we may be dominant and irrelevant at the same time. Ladies and gentlemen, it all starts with NATO bodies and allies persistently federated with nations, partners, commands, industry and academia to share our understanding and leverage the power of our info, info innovation ecosystem. For me, the main questions are, are we willing to share and do we really trust each other or not? In practical terms, we at ACT have just released a detailed proposal to develop an emerging and disruptive technology roadmap in order to deliver rapid, tangible demonstrations that will help shape, accelerate, and set the conditions for the use of disruptive technologies within NATO. Our focus initially is on enhancing our situational awareness by leveraging all data sources, that means open source and traditional intelligence, to aid in decision making, enhancing our readiness by first seeing ourselves in a great, greater detail to, uh, to provide executable options for SECURE, our sister command in Europe, which is responsible for current operation. And finally, capability development efforts in critical shortfall, shortfall areas driven by the NATO defense planning process. We know the that future requirements are already at NATO's and its members' doorsteps. But the time to transform our capabilities is running out, and we have to speed up at all levels. I am deeply convinced that NATO's success will be based on enabling our policy changes, which leads to adopting these kind of capabilities quickly. This will ensure we can deter, defend, and project stability now and in the future. That is what NATO as an organization and its member nations owe to their soldiers, airmen, sailors, marines, and societies. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Admiral, for uh, uh, this uh, very uh, in-depth and, frankly, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, you touched uh, upon a lot of aspects uh, of actually going beyond uh, just the, the, the issues of military transformation, but the link with, with policy, with ethics, with uh, legal aspects. So, uh, yes, I, uh, I, I, will, I found, found it extremely uh, useful and, and timely and interesting. And um, let me start with, uh, with a question which is frankly linked with uh, this kind of um, philosophical approach that you, you put forward towards the end of the presentation. Um, you, you highlighted uh, the fact that um, the, there is a need to um, have a better interaction between uh, military and civilians because uh, 
uh, a lot of the uh, threats that might uh, develop from disruptive technologies uh, could be actually thrown uh, at civilian um, uh, population. Is it won't be just a force-on-force -force, um, approach? And we are already in a hybrid paradigm uh, for for so many uh, reasons. So my my first question um, is um, um, the the following: Do you think that um, the uh, there is enough res there are enough resources invested? Uh, into the kind of thinking and planning, uh, military thinking and planning beyond the uh, capabilities in the physical domains, uh, which we all know how it's done and it's, uh, it's continuing to uh, thorough. So are we uh, what I would call uh, overcoming this kind of analog hangover, uh, that means focusing on the physical world or physically neighbors, and shifting towards, uh, towards the, the virtual world and the addressing the new technologies. And um, if it's not enough, what prevents us and what more uh, should we do in this, uh, in this sense? Um, thank you very much uh, for, for this um, question. Um, for me, it's, first of all, much more important to change the mindset uh, in, in all parts of uh, our society, society. And for me, it's much more important to share what is already existing and what is the way ahead. Um, and then we should think about resources. Of course, as a military, I would always say I need more resources. Uh, otherwise, I would be the wrong person in, in my job. But, never, but, uh, but, but nevertheless, I think we have to think different, and that's my, my biggest concern at the moment, that we are much more focused in the past and, to sp and spend too less into the future, because it was comfortable to have the, um, the good old times of, uh, of uh, the Cold War. Uh, we, 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 uh, we, uh, we, we all of us were aware, were, uh, um, were aware uh, what is the um, uh, line of attack? What is the line of uh, defense? But now we are talking about 360 degree, deg uh, degree uh, view. And targets may be different. Um, um, lack of water may be a challenge. Uh, lack of healthcare in the African continent may be a target. And I think uh, only in the military environment we will not uh, get the uh, solution because I'm deeply convinced everything is connected with everything. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, now, you know, in the past, um, I would say, breakthroughs in, in military technology was very much uh, driven and sponsored by governments. Uh, uh, we see that uh, now uh, it's the private sector that's driving the technological breakthrough. And frankly, governments, the military are... are following it. Uh, so what, how, how does uh, ACT address um, uh, this link with the private sector, with an industry? Is there any specific partnership that you're developing with industry uh, like ac to, to sim stimulate access to innovation, innovation hubs, and so on? What are the, the policies and the mechanisms that you're using to, to, to be connected with the, the breakthrough technologies? So first of all, I think we spend a lot of time to open our doors because you are completely right. In the past, the doors were open for the classical defense industry. Right. And uh, I totally agree. In the past, military development, a uh, progress in technology was adapted than in the civilian em environment. And this completely changed. The Googles, the Amazons, uh, and other uh, organizations are the, uh, the trendsetters for the future. And we are not used to uh, cooperate and uh, uh, to, uh, um, uh, work, uh, to work together, and the other way around. So we are used in the past to, to deal with the classical defense industry in Europe and in the United States. But I, in between, I think we have to realize that developments in the civilian environment will have much more impact in the military environment than the past. And so I would 
it's a strong approach, but I, I, I strongly believe it changed completely. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Also linked to, to um, being um, uh, efficient and effective with interacting with, with industry, I'm trying to raise now the issue of uh, the procurement process and acquisition processes within, uh, within NATO. That used to be um, long cycles, and of course they were linked to the, the major physical platforms, be they Navy, airframes, and so on. So is there any work in terms of making the process faster, especially for IT procurement? Otherwise, we would be uh, condemned to having always the technologies of the past. Yeah. We are stressing this point on all occasions. And uh, I think everybody in civilian lives can, can see how quick uh, IT is changing. And uh, I would say every year it is making a lot of progress. And that's not in line with our uh, decision-making process at the military environment and even we depend on political uh, decisions. And I think um, we have uh, even uh, to, uh, to think about how to manage, and I don't have the final solution, to operate with the current procurement, with the current uh, possibilities, and to adapt at the same time. So in the past, let me stress perhaps in, in a Navy example, we ordered new ships. We got them 20 years later, and then we realized, OK, the world has changed, and the procurement does not fit to the current situation. And to find a solution, which is really complicated, because budget guys are in, in, involved, and national interests are involved, to find a solution which prevents us from making these mistakes and to become better, uh, that's a challenge. and military alone can't solve this problem. But uh, it's an, uh, when we are talking about a 360 degree view, it should not only be a military view, the whole society and nations should have and share this view. Let me stress, for instance, the Arctic, what will happen in the Arctic, the ice will melt, and then there is a strong interest in that area. Are we prepared for this situation? or were we prepared for the development of the refugee crisis in the African continent? Of course, we had some indicators, but we didn't uh, uh, or we couldn't decide earlier, and now we have to fix the problems. Uh, let me refer to the process of training education exercises where Atlantic Command Transformation has a lead and it develops uh, multi-year programs. Uh, how much is the, the focus that you, you emphasized on the new developments, the emerging challenges, how much has this changed your, your, the curricula for training or these exercise scenarios? Can you give us some examples of how this has uh, evolved? Yes. So we, we own, NATO owns the uh, NATO school of Amagao, and um, in the past we offered uh, yeah, traditional military training. That's not necessary. When we are talking about um, human-machine interaction, we have to train our people how to, to manage uh, uh, this. Uh, we have uh, to train um, uh, people about artificial in intelligence, uh, what kind of impact uh, this may have. We changed our training programs. It's not a, a, um, a no longer people will go to Am over Amagao for two, three, four weeks get some training, we make long distance training and all these um, things, but there's a long way to go. And, and now let me come to one of my favorite subjects, which is um, uh, cyber defense. You, you, you said that you have a personal opinion that uh, uh, this uh, distinction between cyber defense offense is a bit, uh, bit artificial and I, I suppose that when we speak of, of defense, like in all the other domains, you, you do it with all means available, not just with resilience and, and, and so on. So um, how um, do you think that the creation of this uh, cyber operations center uh, in the, as a new element of the NATO command structure that was just endorsed by defense ministers, and I think it will be also finally approved by the leaders of the, as I say, the government at the summit. How would uh, this um, affect NATO's approach uh, in, in terms of cyber 
uh, defense uh, in, in a broad sense without actually this distinction that you, you, you yourself mentioned uh, to be a bit. Yes, of course. But um, I think we agree that cyber will have impact on all parts of the military, but not only on the, on the military. It's a, a, a domain which is across air, land, uh, and sea. And we, we strongly believe um, what kind of incidents, what kind of impact uh, cyber may have in, uh, in operations, but not only in operations. Look at the incidents which happened in, in the in UK, I think, when they closed the hospitals because they couldn't use uh, their uh, IT equipment. So this is a kind of soft kill, uh, I would say. So in general, it's a combination. NATO itself in the military environment should take care about cyber, which is important. And we didn't uh, um, implement a new cyber command. Why? Because we know exactly that the experts in cyber are limited in all nations. And so we try uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, we try, uh, uh, to, to manage a new approach, that we align the existing capabilities in the nations with NATO, and not building, first of all, a huge um, a huge uh, organization and then asking the question for what purpose. Thank you for that. Let me now open the floor for, uh, for questions and uh, have somebody in the first uh, row. Uh, colleagues uh, will offer mics and please introduce yourself and then uh, formulate the questions. Sure. Excellent presentation. George Nicholson of Washington Liaison for the Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. Last week, we had a major uh, symposium here in Washington, and it was the EU Security and Defense Washington Symposium 2018. Numerous uh, defense ministers from Europe, J uh, the Director of Plans and Policy from the African Command, uh, and Senator Joni Ernst from the Senate Armed Services Committee, who's chairman of the Emergency Threats and Capabilities. One of the issues that kept being brought up, particularly by the defense minister, was what's the balance between NATO's requirements and the European Union defense requirements. And it was alluded to that, that the European Union seems to think that we need to also focus on the necessity of maintaining the industrial base in European countries. And they use as an example when we had the replacement for the KCX tanker, the original, the original source was going to be the Airbus 330. But then because of political pressures, uh, they were eliminated and we went with the 7, 767. So again, your, your, your comments on that. The other th last thing is Senator Ernst talked about her objectives for the NATO conference coming up was one, and you've alluded to parts of it, is we've got to look at, at artificial intelligence, mechanical learning, and hypersonics. And then she also said we've got a real problem with some of the NATO partners like Turkey, and I know whether you can talk to this, uh, getting the F-35, but also getting the Russian state-of-the-art air defense system. And there is markup language in our current Defense Authorization Act uh, to go ahead and refuse to give Turkey the F-35 because are they going to be a reliable partner? Please accept that I'm not a politician, so I can uh, give uh, you uh, the answer because it, it's a political decision if uh, Turkey will get the, th the F-35 or not. But coming back to your, your uh, introduction about EU-NATO cooperation, and that concerns us a, uh, is, uh, a lot, because finally, looking at the military environment, we have a single set of forces. And in so far, the, the, the use of military power is completely independent from, uh, from EU, NATO, or whatever. That's politically decided. But we should avoid duplications, and that's our problem. And um, uh, of course, you are aware about the uh, ongoing discussion in Germany, uh, in, uh, in Europe, about um, uh, um, uh, workflow, work share in, in building ships, airplanes, and so on. Um, and of course, um, it's challenging. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we have to think about how to align, for instance, our defense planning process with the corresponding EU process CDP. And believe it or not, sometimes it's only a question of classification if we can exchange the, uh, the existing papers. Mm -hmm. you, may be, you may laugh uh, about this, but that's the, uh, the truth. 
we have to investigate a deep, di deep dive, and I think the ambassador will agree, in our processes and procedures. And finally, we are at the end uh, talking about the question of trust. In an area of big data, it doesn't make sense to separate the EU from NATO uh, procurement for alignment and, and, and so on. Thank you. Uh, there's another question for Lucas for the floor. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Chris Radcliffe. I'm an intern with the IISS. Um, so when you were going over the 2018 NATO summit, you mentioned during your first point about uh, AI and human teaming that, uh, that AI may in some cases take human decision making out of the picture completely. Uh, could you comment a bit more on that and maybe as you're commenting on that, give a description as to how, uh, how NATO plans to prevent AI from uh, making decisions that humans particularly wouldn't want them to make if their decision making was taken out completely? So I think I'm, I'm, I'm uh, the wrong person you, uh, to, to answer your question because I'm not uh, familiar with the, with the technical uh, uh, details. But uh, of course, we have to offer solutions because I explained in my, in my speech uh, that there are sometimes concerns and fears that these uh, new technology will operate without any um, observation by, by human beings. Um, of course, uh, we have to implement tools, for instance. We have to discuss in advance what kind of ethical questions will, will be affected. But we are on the journey already. So I can't offer your solutions, but we are aware about uh, your concerns and what you have mentioned. Um, there's another question here and two others to follow. Thank you. I'm uh, Tsipora Fried. I'm the uh, senior advisor to the uh, French vice chairman of the joint staff. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. You uh, outlined the, the key points of innovation, which is uh, quite fashionable today, uh, but it's also uh, a deep process. And you mentioned the uh, difficulty to integrate innovation into the uh, long-term process of building capacities, which is our key problem. So how do we solve the question of agility uh, and uh, not only staying on the, on the wish <laughs> we, could, we could make it? Yeah. So our intention is, once again, I, I can only share my, my, my views and uh, explain the necessity. So when I'm talking about the NATO defense planning process, that means the short term, when you are investigating in this NDPP, you will not find no word about artificial intelligence and other things. Our impetus and our intention is to integrate this in the next cycle. And the next cycle will start in, 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 in autumn. Uh, and we are already in discussions with the nations. Uh, of course, some of them have completely different views. But we have to find a solution because uh, waiting for uh, another two, three, four years uh, would be a, a big mistake. Because my understanding is the technology is already available. And many of us are embracing this technology in civilian life. So why not to implement this in the military envi environment? And um, finally, that's, we, we can only uh, touch this point. We can mention it. We can try to convince the nations. But you are aware, 29 nations have to agree. And that's a challenge. Yeah, but the, the, uh, in, in our analysis is completely uh, on track with what you s explained. Thank you. There was uh, one question in the back and then a series of questions. Yeah, on the right. Yeah, on the right. Ambassador. Yes. Ambassador. Yeah, two. yes, but first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't, didn't know. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I wanted to follow up on the artificial intelligence question a little bit. Um, our previous Deputy Secretary of Defense, Bob Work, has stated that artificial intelligence might change not just the character of war, but also its nature. Um, do you see this as potentially being the case? And if so, I mean, what are, the, what are these foundational changes that we're seeing with this introduction? So I totally agree what Bob Work said. And um, I think uh, the United States took much earlier care about the possibilities about artificial intelligence than nations in Europe. And they made already changes here in, in, in the US. And I uh, realized that um, already all services in the United States are convinced that they have to invest into, the, uh, into uh, artificial intelligence. 
And I read a couple of weeks ago a report that all services will uh, spend a, a, at least a, um, a, um, some million already this year. So they are aware, and, but even I believe in the United States, you don't have the final solution, but you, you, you accept and you understood that we have to deal with this. And, in though, and so far, yes, artificial intelligence, when I talked about human machines inter, uh, interaction, that is, for instance, a difference to the past. When, when you think about, um, um, uh, about airplanes, manned airplanes for, uh, uh, for observation in some areas, in the future it may be that we will have remote control air, airplanes in, in these areas. And then we have to think about ethical questions, who is controlling these airplanes, all these things. And that will change, uh, from my perspective, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, military environment um, um, very, very much. Thank but you. Uh, once again, we, 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 are, we are good in analyzing the, these topics, but we are on a journey, and we have to make our experience and our, um, our um, experts um, aware about these topics. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Galen Petruso, IDA. With a lot of these short-term initiatives, there are some concrete metrics that you can sort of measure them by. I'm thinking about readiness, burden sharing. As you look at transformation, what are the benchmarks? What are sort of the metrics and measurables that you look for? Benchmarks. It's a um, a challenge in in the uh, in the military of, uh, uh, environment because we didn't have these benchmarks. It's a a, a question which is uh, is um, um, in 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 the economical uh, environment. I, uh, at the moment, to be very frank, we are not thinking about de benchmarks. But I will take it with me. Perhaps it may be. A, a possibility to bet to to uh, to be uh, better in the future. If I may add to this from the cyber um, experience, because uh, the uh, you know the beauty with NATO is that uh, once it addresses a, a domain, it does it thoroughly, and it has a process called the defense planning process. So when NATO decided to include cyber capability targets in the defense planning process, then we had matrix and so on, but it took some time. Yeah. And that's why we're not yet ready to address issues beyond that, like artificial intelligence and so on. You're right. Uh, there were two questions uh, to request for the floor here in the front. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is John Mann. My question is about, uh, you made a very good point earlier about how war has become very uh, multidimensional, 360 degrees. It's no longer the simple conventional lines of attack. But I think it's also important to remember newer types of warfare haven't replaced conventional warfare. They haven't completely done away with the traditional battlefield, but they are simply an addition. So my question is, what is your opinion on how NATO can best integrate these newer transformational technologies with conventional military doctrine to, in order to optimize all of the different limited resources that you have? Yes, of course. I think it's obvious that artificial in, in intelligence will be part of tanks, ships, future tanks, ships, and airplanes, without doubt. Um, and in so far, um, I, I, I believe that a, um, we need kinetics like tanks, ships, aircraft, even in the future, because uh, I can't see, when we cooperate much more with the non-defense industry, that uh, kinetics will be outsourced or delivered uh, to non-military uh, people. But the question is what kind of additional added value these new technologies offer. Look at the micro drones in these small drones, what kind of uh, knowledge, what kind of expertise, what kind of uh, possibility is implemented, and they are becoming cheaper and cheaper. The, the new drones uh, uh, have a, a, a kind of capacity and a possibility, possibilities which we should use in the military in environment. And once again, I'm not quite sure. Once again, we, we are starting this process. We are convincing nations that's necessary to think about 
the new technologies, to adapt the new technologies in the military environment. And to be very frank, at the moment, I, I observe a huge gap between civilian use of artificial intelligence and military use. And our challenge will be that this gap is not becoming bigger and bigger. We have to at least to stop it and perhaps to close it a little bit. And uh, that's our intention. But uh, we need support because the expertise in the military environment about the possibilities is limited. Okay, good, good point. Please. Yes, thank you, Admiral Nelson. Uh, my name is Mike Irochus. Um, a lot of the transformation that you talked about with NATO is heavily dependent on receiving the necessary funding. Are you optimistic that NATO will have the funding to be able to achieve uh, the goals of transformation that you talked about? And uh, what pressure is being put on those nations that are not meeting their goal of the 2% uh, GDP? Mm -hmm. Of course, um, to, to be very frank, it's finally a political decision. If politicians believe that we have to invest more in defense spending, we will make the money available. That's my understanding. But uh, I'm, on the other hand, I would uh, um, uh, initiate even a discussion. When we are talking about funding, we should not only think about money, but we should even think about manning. And that's my concern when I'm looking forward into the future, that the money will be, uh, will be available on political decision. For instance, in my country, because I, I realize, of course, that I will get the question, we spend at the mo moment 30 billion in solving the refugee crisis, and this money was not in, in the budget. But my concern is uh, the European countries, and not only the European countries, uh, in a position to get enough people. And that's even a challenge in the United States. You are looking for 1,500 pilots, and you can't get it, or, although you are spending a lot of money. In my country, we are facing a demographic impact, which is tremendous. In my birth year, 1.3 million boys and girls were born. My son is 30 years younger than I, and in his birth year and all upcoming other years, only 700,000 people were born. And that means we are, especially in Germany, a, a society which is becoming older and older. And 20 years ahead, we will no, not have 81 million citizens like today, but perhaps only 65. And that's my, my response. Of course, once again, we, NATO, as institution, we depend on the political decisions to spend money and manpower. And we can only ask for, we can explain why this is necessary, but finally, the decisions are made by politicians, and I like this uh, kind of burden sharing. Thank you. Uh, there was another question here from and afterwards. Hey, sir, uh, Major Hildebrandt from the uh, Trans Regional Threat Coordination Cell at the Pentagon. Um, how much buy in are you getting from uh, private sector and academia into cooperating with new innovations and things like that? Are they, do you have any success stories or anything that you could uh, give us? No, unfortunately not. Uh, we, we, we try, as I said already, to open the doors, to come in contact. Um, and um, for me, it's really impressive uh, when we get in, uh, invitations for, uh, from universities, think tanks, uh, that they say, okay, we, we are not aware that NATO is dealing with these, uh, 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 with these topics. Uh, because in the past, we were not connected with these, uh, with these companies, with these uh, people, many many people in in the universities, I'm talking for Europe, didn't have any personal military experience. So the, we have to tear down the walls, and we as military have to express that we accept the leadership in some areas by others, and not only always we are sitting in the driver's chair, which is a challenge for many military people. But. I, I, my observation is the doors are open, but it will take time. And that's why we are always on a promotion tour, not only in, 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 uh, in NATO. And believe it or not, 
in all uh, civilian companies, nobody will fight against the development directorate. In NATO, we have to explain why NATO needs such a, 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 such a, a tool. Please. Yeah. Hi, uh, Carl Galvin, Domain Reference and Idea Lives on .net. And sir, thank you for being here. And I do have a more general question about NATO that's perhaps a little politically incorrect. Uh, there's a book by Dr. Paul L. Williams titled Operation Gladio, referring to apparently a NATO operation throughout Europe during uh, well, the Cold War. And it attributes um, many instances of terrorism in Europe having been perpetrated by NATO assets in ways that would cause the communists to appear to blame when in fact they were not. And my question is just within NATO, are you familiar with whether something like Operation Gladio actually existed and whether you know, those allegations seemingly well documented are true? To be very frank, not to my knowledge, uh, Ambassador, I don't know if it's no. in, in, but in the middle, yeah, not to my knowledge. Please. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey. I'm an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Uh, th this was an amazing tour to the horizon. Thank you very much. Um, personally, I think it's wonderful when NATO allies get to buy top-of-the-line Russian systems. I, I can't think of a greater gift, and so I'm puzzled as, as to our reaction to that. Um, I wanted to ask about some future horizons in another way. Um, can we do a better job coming up with the supranational INW enhancements? Can we do a better job um, creating or expanding think tank capacity uh, at NATO? I, I think that's a huge hole. And um, do you see any possible um, members? Uh, I'd love to see Malta and Cyprus uh, join NATO. Um, because of the maritime capacity in those two places. Have we ever pitched those two places? So we can always be better, to, to, be, to be very frank. And I think um, especially in those areas in which NATO or the military is fami not familiar, we need and we depend on cooperation and a discussion uh, with different institutions, as you said. Um, one of our main products we we um, we publish every two years. It's named was well, as I said a strategic foresight analysis, and uh, this is not a, a approach or attempt to predict what the future is, but to come together with think tanks, with academia, with non-state actors in order to identify what is the way ahead. So nobody. Um, alone is a, in, in the position to solve these problems. Uh, we have to discuss it. We have to 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 put, as I, I, I said, the the uh, the the pieces of a puzzle a little bit bit uh, um, together, so that we have an an idea about the possible picture in the future. Um, we are we are a. Um, um, uh, uh, initiating uh, participation, we invite think tanks and and uh, and so on. But once again, uh, it's it's a long. A NATO, a NATO think tank. Um, uh, we don't have these think tanks. Yeah. When we thought about the future in the past, it was replacement of tanks, ships, airport, uh, air, 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 airplanes, as I, I said. Um, I'm I'm not quite sure if it's uh, if it's the best solution to build up a think tank, a huge think tank, or it's a better approach like we do with the cyber, um, um, uh, cyber uh, um, um, institute in, in, in Europe, that we bring these guys together and, uh, and uh, try to, best, uh, to, to find a common uh, solution and uh, the best uh, approach um, ahead. I'm not quite sure. So. Um, I, I don't know, Ambassador, if, if it's. I, I'm one possible. of the uh, supporters of such such an idea okay. because you need uh, some some entity that drives the agenda forward without actually being linked to the kind of 
political correctness and so on. Somehow it's happening through the centers of excellence yeah. on different domains. And NATO has an ecosystem of center of excellence that are owned by the sponsoring nations, are uh, certified by Atlantic Command Transformation, and they're, they are allowed to go beyond the existing policy with the, within NATO. But they still uh, are not like a, a single body. So. Um, but, I, I was I was a, I was a supporter of, of this uh, yeah. of, of such an idea. The European Union has a number of uh, think tanks uh, of its yeah. own, uh, including one at the level of the president of the Commission, and uh, I think this could be bridging a bit yeah. the, the, the gap uh, in terms of uh, what I could, could call yeah. the knowledge gap yeah. from what's new on the technology market and so on, and what's to bring to bring be yeah, brought at the level of political. Yeah. Leaders. Thank you for mentioning uh, this, and that will be part of the new um, reorganization of NATO. The ambassador is right. We own no, NATO owns no center of excellence. The nations own these centers of excellence. Uh, perhaps one famous center of excellence is Cyber Center of Excellence in Tallinn, yeah. uh, which does a tremendous uh, work, uh, of course. Um, but these centers are owned by nations. They, that are not many people, sometimes only 20 to 30, but they are not aligned. And that's our approach in the future, that ACT will have more hands on the centers of ex, on the centers of ex. They should not be subordinated command because the centers of excellence are in a favorable uh, position. They are certified by NATO, but they can work at the same time for different organizations. It's no problem to work even for the EU. If we will have a NATO centers of excellence under our command, it will raise yeah. some political concerns uh, uh, like some of you uh, mentioned already. But of course, it's, it's a kind of capacity, um, but it's a, in 24 centers of excellence, in total, I think uh, a thousand people are working. Uh, civilians as well as militaries. They uh, are hosting conferences all over the year. Uh, we use these centers of excellence, for instance, um, to solve problems of interoperability. Uh, they will be in the position in, in the future, if the uh, heads of states agree, uh, to write doctrines. Doctrines, that's from my perspective necessary on the one hand side, but if they write these centers of, if, if the centers of excellence write the doctrines, we can use them for NATO and EU at the same times, and that makes a lot of sense, for instance. But uh, even uh, they uh, invite people from other organizations, from other uh, areas, other, um, other um, background. Uh, but uh, I think, my understanding, centers of excellence think tank, I think, that would be much uh, too, too much flowers. Uh, well, it, it, again, it, 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 it they it do have work a great work. role. Yes, so that's why I, I, I'm a yeah. supporter of this idea. I will take one last question in, in the back, and uh, then we'll try to wrap it up. Thank you very much for give, uh, asking the question. Uh, my name is Hattori Nagao. I belong to the Hudson Institute, and my subject is U.S.-Japan-India security cooperation, not NATO, unfortunately. But uh, my question is related to with this subject. The currently, NATO start to cooperate with non-NATO countries. So is there a possibility that the NATO, Japan, India, the technological cooperation, and if it will happen, is it beneficial for NATO, is my question. Yes. We appreciate to, uh, to work together with these uh, countries. And we are already in contact with uh, Japan uh, because we have a huge partnership pro program in, in, in uh, NATO. For us, it's important uh, to get um, information about areas which are not on our main focus. And Australia, and just to mention a few nations which we are in interacting at the moment, Japan, Australia, Jordan, um, 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 Georgia, uh, um, uh, Finland, yeah? um, and, and others across the world. Colombia, uh, for instance. And it's for the benefit, I think, of all nations. Um, we, are, we, um, we, we are listening to these nations, what their interests are, and how to align us better than we did in the past. Well, 
Thank you. Thank you very, very much uh, indeed. This has been a, a tremendously interesting and dynamic uh, dialogue. Uh, thank you for the interest. Let me also thank colleagues from the Hudson Institute who made this uh, event possible, uh, Sheen and then also uh, um, our colleagues uh, from the, from, uh, who are the interns um, with, with Hudson. Um, Admiral, I hope this is not the. This is just the first time, but not the uh, only time that you're coming uh, at Hassan. Um, it, it was really uh, an um, eye-opener uh, discussion, and there is a lot going on in NATO uh, at, again at accelerated speed. So I hope to, to to have the honor and the chance to to host you again once uh, once again. Thanks for the. Um, uh, generous presentation and for the insights, very direct, very uh, honest and straightforward and very open. Um, and with this, I would invite everyone to give a round of applause for our guests. <laughs>